Welcome to another in our series of questions asked in the Old Testament. Our question today comes from the book of Esther, chapter 4, verse 14. Who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? To give our question context, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 17 of Esther, chapter 4. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting. And many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him, and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Athak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner coat without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me... I have not been called to come in to the king these thirty days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And... Who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish." Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Our question for the day is, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? It is the question that Mordecai asks of Esther. I've spoken before of my wife and my own interest in putting together jigsaw puzzles and the frustration that comes when it seems you just can't find that one particular piece. I will often say, they must not have put this one piece in the box. It's nowhere to be found, only to find it later right in front of me. Recently, however, that last piece was in fact missing. It had been brushed off onto the floor, and when every piece was put in place, we looked on the floor, under the table, and Voila! There it was. No matter that we'd found the other 999 pieces, it was incomplete without that last piece. That one piece in the puzzle, without that there, seemed like a gaping hole big enough to walk through. Such is life at times. It is the same with team sports when the star player is out and the team seems to be so much weaker. Or how about the symphony that is missing that musician that is key to the performance? Or a chorus without that one to sing the solo? Or play without the lead actor? You get the point. 
we can perceive the whole that is left when that one person is absent. How about in the providence of God? Oh, sure, in sports you just call on the substitute player to fill in. In music, the second chair. In the chorus, the next best singer. And in the stage performance, you will always have the understudy. But who knows whether you have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai seems to have a pretty good grasp of the situation here in the book of Esther. His first response is to tear his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes. King David and all his men tore their clothes at the death of King Saul and his sons, and also at the death of Abner. Job tore his clothes when he learned of the catastrophe involving all he owned and the death of his children. Ashes were also a sign of great distress. We find that Job also repented in sackcloth and ashes in Job 42. Joshua and the elders tore their clothes and put dust on their heads at their defeat at Ai in Joshua chapter 7. The people of Nineveh wore sackcloth and sat in ashes when they heard the preaching of Jonah. This was a well-known show of humiliation in the ancient world in times of great anguish and sorrow. Mordecai knows well the potential for disaster that is about to ensue. He sees the big picture and understands that piece of the puzzle that is so important. That long and winding road that has led to this moment has not escaped his notice. We may look at this situation that Esther is in as being quite undignified. We may bristle at the thought that this young woman's attributes have been focused on beauty and outward features, having spent an entire year preparing in oil and myrrh with six months in spices and ointments for women in chapter 2. It may seem humiliating for these young virgins to be brought before the king only to satisfy his lusty appetite. After all, it was his vanity and pride that led to his first wife, Queen Vashti, to rebel against him for his drunken exploits of women in chapter 1. But like Job, we lack the omniscience of God to understand the complexity of the, the big picture. We look at ancient history through modern eyes and cannot comprehend the how and why of such things. Our cousin Mordecai understands the times and the providence of God. He also understands that in the providence of God, men and women must take their place. He warns against the momentary temptation of Esther to consider her safe self from, safe from the impending doom that looms on the horizon and to reflect upon the remarkable journey which she now finds herself and that this journey has the providence of God, though unnamed, but implied nonetheless. This journey has not been for her comfort and ease, but for a cause bigger than one can imagine. We can look back and see that the very lifeblood of humanity hangs in the balance at the feet of this young girl. For in the survival of the Jews is the rescue of the Redeemer, who will one day be born in a little town of obscurity, centuries into the future, without which the blood will not be shed to offer hope for mankind. And who knows what we have been called to do at such a time as this. Our twelfth in the series comes from Psalm 8. Psalm 8, verse 4, which asks the question, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? To give us a context of this passage, we'll be reading Psalm 8 in its entirety, verses 1 through 9. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth! You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. 
You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. There is a peculiarity for humans, for sure. Much of what we are as human beings is quite extraordinary. But I would call to your attention a moment in the thought process of humans that really is of a <laughs> extraordinary nature in itself. Perhaps it is one to which you can relate. I've noted this moment at various times in my own life. It may be that such a moment has a tag or a name, that, but I'm unaware of what it might be called. All that I can do is describe it to the best of my ability and the circumstances surrounding this moment. Here goes. It usually occurs at a time when I'm surveying a scene before me. It is as if my heart stops for what seems a noticeable a time and a gasp for breath and all of my muscles tense and I blink hard. No, it's not a cardiac arrest or a fit that I'm experiencing of a medical nature. It is as though my breath is taken away in awe of what I'm beholding and a realization of my own smallness in this universe. Can you relate to this? When I read Psalm 8, I get the impression that what I have experienced from time to time is akin to what the psalmist David describes. If I really look at the wording he uses in verse 3, I will understand that he is pondering these things while the sun is absent, the nighttime, either early evening or before the dawn. Notice he doesn't mention the sun, only the heavens and the moon and the stars. A scholar also noted that David wrote his psalms when he was an adult, since he was the sweet psalmist of Israel and inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these, as we read in 2 Samuel 23, 1 and 2. And the Holy Spirit came on him as anointing by Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 3. I say this as a way of reminding myself that David is not writing this as a bright-eyed little shepherd boy guarding sheep but likely as an adult, knowing full well his own sinful nature. With this in mind, David reflects upon the vastness and majesty of the heavens above in all their splendor, and supposing that they have been formed by the mere fingers of God, not by strength, but by skill, which David understood being a musician who played the harp himself. With all of this in mind, David turns to man and his nature. Corrupt, willful, and most often at odds with his Creator. And we as humans are a little lower than those who were created to do the Lord's will. And the writer of Hebrews tells us, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Hebrews 1.14, speaking of angels. In Psalm 8, it is stated that all creation is subject to man, as Genesis 1.28 tells us. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every little thing that moves along the earth. However, in Hebrew 2.26, the writer directs the reader's attention to this question posed in Psalm 8 and relates it to Jesus who often referred to himself as the Son of Man. For a thousand years, this passage had been read in reference to mere man. And now the writer of Hebrews opens the ears to all who will hear the messianic implications of this most profound of questions. It is worth noting that the Greek word for care here is the same word Jesus uses in reference to those who were sick and then they were visited in Matthew 25, 36. We may well still wonder now, 3,000 years after David wrote this, as to why God is mindful of mankind seeing the condition of our world. 
The Apostle John tells us in perhaps the most recognizable verse in the New Testament, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. He loved us enough that He did indeed visit us when He came down and endured the humiliation, the suffering, and death so that you and I might have a hope beyond this life. Have you ever had that feeling that takes your breath away at the thought that God cares so much for you? Our question today comes from the 22nd Psalm, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To give our question the context, we'll be reading the entirety of the 22nd Psalm, beginning in verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. In our question today, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In verse 1. There is a lesson that I am constantly learning in life. Over and over, I revisit this session for instruction in life. What is this lesson, you ask? It is the admonition that I really don't know what other people are experiencing or feeling. 
The best I can do is to empathize with that person and acknowledge that they are experiencing a profound emotion within. Even if I have been through a similar event in my own life, I cannot truly know the heart of another. That's a biblical concept. You can look it up. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.11, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And Solomon proclaims in Proverbs 14.10, The heart knows its own bitterness, and no stranger shares its joy. I have read and listened to some who have pontificated on what Jesus went through on the cross. While I appreciate the attempts to peer into this experience, I know that I cannot even begin to grasp what went through our Savior's mind that fateful day. Some have argued that God did not really forsake Jesus on the cross. Now, that may be a conversation best had with Jesus one day in heaven when we come face to face with how much was done for us in that act of self-sacrifice there on Golgotha. This question that Jesus asked poses uh, in one of the seven sayings from the cross. The first saying we read in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. The second saying is, Today you will be with me in paradise, Luke 23, 43. In John 19, Jesus addresses his mother and the apostle John when he says, Woman, behold your son, and behold your mother. Our question for today is in the middle of Matthew 27, 46, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The fifth saying is, I thirst, from John 19, 28. In John 19, 30, we read Jesus saying, It is finished. And finally, the last thing that Jesus proclaimed on the cross was, Into your hands I commit my spirit, Luke 23, 46. The first and last statements are directed to the Father, as well as the middle statement. David is called the sweet psalmist of Israel in 2 Samuel 23.1 and declares that the Holy Spirit of the Lord speaks to him, or speaks by him, in verse 2 of that same chapter. So it is with the 22nd Psalm, known as the Messianic Psalm, that the Holy Spirit, a thousand years before the cross, describes in great detail the scene there at Golgotha. There's an old spiritual song that asks the question, were you there when they crucified my Lord? I believe the one that penned that song grasped the feelings we all might share when we truly contemplate that day. Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, 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 the author pens that. I can only imagine for a thousand years what my brothers and sisters under the old law must have thought when they read and sung that 22nd psalm. In such stark, descriptive language, David paints a picture in our mind of that scene. The Gospel writers, too, described in detail that scene. But only Jesus knew what he felt when he declared, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I hope that one day when I stand before the great I Am, that he shall acknowledge me and that I will not be forsaken. Don't you hope for the same? Our 14th in this series comes from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1 and verse 3, which asks the question, What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? To give our question the context, we'll be reading chapter 1 of the Book of Ecclesiastes, beginning in verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. 
All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it is said, See, this is new. It has already been in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to come among those who come after. I, the preacher, had been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out, by wisdom, all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to no wisdom and to no madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after win. For in much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Recently, my granddaughter was visiting, and I took her for a tour around the area where her mother had grown up and showed her some of the places that we had spent. In another career, I was a contractor and did a bit of roofing. As I showed her some of the homes and businesses I roofed, I noticed that they had been re-roofed. All of the roofing that I had done was already replaced. Not that my labor was faulty, but such is the nature of the material. It's only designed to last 20 to 25 years, and they had reached their life expectancy. Nonetheless, I felt a, a sort of emptiness at the thought that all of my labor those many years ago had been covered over and replaced. Solomon asked a question right at the beginning of his work. We don't even have time to settle in before he hits us with one of the biggest of the big questions of life. In essence, he asks, what are we here for? What is the meaning of life? Actually, he has already concluded this even before he poses the question. Vanity, emptiness, meaninglessness. That's what life is. Every aspect seems that way. The sun goes round and round, generations come and generations go. The wind blows here and the wind comes back again to where it started. Water cycles its way around the world and comes back to its beginning, only to start the cycle again. Everywhere Solomon looks, he sees the same pattern. Well, that's the price you pay for wisdom. Solomon found out the price you pay for wisdom. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. In verse 18 of chapter 1. So what's the point? It is interesting that Solomon begins the book by describing some cyclical aspects of the world around us. The sun, the wind, the water, and man's labors. He will spend the entirety of the book examining the meaninglessness, emptiness, and vanity of life only to come right back to where he starts in the final verses of the book. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is man's all. By Solomon, you crafty wordsmith, you. You created your own cycle within a cycle. Well played, my friend. Well played. I suppose Solomon could have simplified this entire treatise on the meaning of one's life by saying concisely, Don't wear yourself out in selfish pursuits. Just fear God and do what He tells you. But that would be rather anticlimactic, don't you think? Someone once told me, learn from other people's mistakes. You won't live long enough to make them all yourself. That certainly would have saved me a great deal of grief had I actually believed it and acted upon that advice. In reality, that's exactly what Solomon is telling us. In a nutshell, Look at how I have wasted my life on empty pursuits, only to find I knew the answer all along. After all, isn't that what God told Solomon when he became the king of Israel in 1 Kings 3.14? When he told him, 
And if you walk in my ways, keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Aren't you glad we've learned that lesson in our lives? Our question today comes from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 4, God asked the question, What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done for it? To give our question context, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 7 of Isaiah chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I look for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, and for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. There's a certain phrase that travelers look for when searching for the perfect vacation. They scour and add line by line, blah, 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 sandy beaches, blah, 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 mountain views, blah, 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 friendly people, etc., until they read those magical words, all-inclusive. All-inclusive means all-inclusive. Meals, transportation, drinks, excursions, everything. After all, we don't want to spend what precious time we have wrangling with a salesperson for the best deal on a rafting trip or a tour of the area. We came to relax and enjoy ourselves, right? The same could be said for buying a house fully furnished or hiring a contractor to build a turnkey house. It's ready to move into. They do the work. We get the pleasure. Just a little background on our passage today. Isaiah wrote this book and identifies the time frame of his writing as being during the reign of kings Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, a span of perhaps 47 years or so. He had seen a lot in his lifetime. When I say Isaiah wrote this, I mean he held the pen, but the Holy Spirit guided him in what to say. That's what the Apostle Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1, chapter, uh, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Here, God is relating a stark reality to the people of Judah, which He calls, My Beloved. What's more, God calls this passage a love song in verse 1. He's not going to lecture them at first, but He's going to sing them a song. What a great song it is of how in His love He builds the turnkey vineyard for the love of His life. Notice the extent to which God goes to bring this gift to perfection. He dug it. He cleared the stones. He used the choicest vines to plant there. He built a watchtower for safety, even puts in a wine vat. All the work was done. The only thing needed for his beloved was to harvest the grapes. Perhaps you've heard the saying, cool story, bro, as it pertains to listening to a tale. Right up to the point of the question, the readers or the hearers, as the case might be, are contemplating this cool story. But they're about to be told that something went wrong, horribly wrong, 
and it's not God's fault. God is not fishing for advice as to how he could have improved on his plan. It was a perfect plan. What follows is a horrific description of what is about to happen with woes, therefores, and beholds connecting one calamity after another upon Judah. If this passage from Isaiah sounds vaguely familiar, you're right. It is much the same figurative language that Jesus uses in his scathing rebuke of the ruling Jews in the first century in Matthew chapter 21. We begin in verse 33 of that chapter. Here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. As the parable continues, we find it has the same lesson to be learned. And he concludes by asking a rather poignant question. In verse 40, he asks, When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Unlike Isaiah's account, Jesus allows those listeners to answer that question. And answer it, they do. In verse 41, they said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Now here's how perceptive they were. In verse 45, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. But just like Judah, the Pharisees refused to change their ways. Now, we would never be so brash as to understand the scriptures and yet do nothing to correct our path, would we? And Lord willing, Let's meet here again tomorrow and look at another question from the Old Testament.